I think we have probably enough questions and items here for an entire semester's worth of <laughs> seminars. Um, let me begin with uh, a, a very straightforward question. Um, Natalie, you, you talked about uh, offering uh, the, the first uh, course on uh, teaching women in uh, the U of T in 1971, and you called it Society and the Sexes. Um, Elizabeth uh, talked about the missing women when uh, she was an undergraduate in the 1980s. Could you both, or all three of you, uh, explain what you see as the main differences in teaching women's history from the 70s onwards? And uh, what has changed? Uh, are we moving in the right direction? How far have we come? Do you want to <laughs> I was afraid you'd say that. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I think that what's changed for me is the experience of the students. Um, that it's a different environment and that students come with very different <coughs> concerns, uh, cons which I wouldn't want to enumerate because I don't particularly want to speak for my students, but I've still been struck by, for example, interest in gender fluidity and breaking down categories of gender, of finding things that were absolutely central for women in the 80s as of less concern and other issues of more concern. So I think that teaching in itself is this fluid process of interaction, which I have found fascinating over the years. I've been very interested in hearing how things have, have shifted for you. Uh, the huge shift is in life on teaching is, is shifting towards thinking about gender systems and, and as I said, masculinity uh, away from an initial focus on women, um, women as uh, you know, the, the missing actors towards um, gender as a system of, <coughs> of power, which I think does inevitably and has profoundly changed the field. It's also changed a lot of the politics of the field. <coughs> We called our course uh, Society and the Sexes specifically because we tried to talk about men for love. Mm -hmm. We didn't do it with the elegance and the subtlety uh, of masculinity studies, but we really did. We did try to, to talk about the construction of, uh, of masculinity uh, in the 16th, 17th century texts and medical texts uh, and uh, about the variety of, of roles. We talked about roles offered to men in a Catholic society where you had the option of being, or for women too, but the option of being a celibate and what this implied. For, so we, we actually tried to do it. Uh, and we were, we were very committed to this uh, at a time that there was some, something of a conflict, and there still is. Uh, these, so it was when I spoke about this in Paris about four years ago, between those who felt that the course should, should be on the history of women. Uh, to, to, I mean, we always had women quite important in the course, and all, all the time I, I taught it. But it seemed to me that you couldn't discuss the topic without it being relational and doing, we called it the sexist because that was the only, <laughs> the only term we, we had. Uh, I, I discovered, Joan Scott reminded me that I had used the word gender in a lecture that I gave at the Women's Berkshire History Conference in, I guess, 1974. But I hadn't thought about it as a category that you could put in your, in your title. Uh, uh, I think that the work on, on sexuality, uh, the addition of queer studies, uh, the uh, deepened work on, on masculinity uh, has, I mean, over the, over the decades. I haven't taught, uh, a course, since 1996 when I retired. Uh, so I, I, I'm not <coughs> constructing syllabi. But from what I could see in my own time, and everything that I've heard, I think this has enriched the program. The, uh, uh, the, the work that has been done in, in global history, global feminisms, uh, the critiques that have come from different parts of the world, uh, if I were to st construct a course now, uh, and I'm sure it's going on here, uh, it would be very, very attentive uh, to, to, to this new work, extremely so. And uh, uh, especially in the advanced courses uh, at Toronto, where we have a very, very large, uh, exciting student body of people, many of whom are first generation uh, going to universities and come from many different parts of the world, for whom the tongue spoken at home may not be English. Uh, uh, it seems to me uh, that, these, that even a standard course without anything fancy uh, is extremely important and they are very well attended, these undergraduate introductory courses. 
I have uh, from people from different fields. But if I were thinking about designing uh, the more, especially the more advanced courses, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, very exciting things are going on here, uh, I would uh, I would do a lot of reshaping from what we were doing in the early days, uh, including. Uh, not necessarily making them start out with gender as the topic, but some other topic in which gender could then uh, be be uh, be reenacted. Uh, I think that uh, that starting off, uh, and I'm thinking of history, with a course on the on, an, on the on the architectural themes that that Anne works on, would be uh, a, a, would be more interesting than necessarily going through the same standard text, maybe the be, on on theory. Uh, something that would just open the field uh, in new ways and allow for comparisons, startling comparisons of, uh, of, of different cultural uh, uh, circumstances. Uh, so th those would be, would be uh, I guess those would be some, some reactions uh, from somebody who uh, is no longer right there in the classroom. Every once in a while I come across a text and I think, oh, I would just, you know, I would, I would love to, uh, uh, I would just love to put this uh, uh, in, a, in such a course, if I were doing it again, uh, and often they are texts, of voice, uh, uh, primary texts from a non-Western setting that has been recently translated and is now available, uh, something that would just open it up. Uh, but as I say, I'm, um, I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I might. Uh, great question, and I might. Um, compare the course I teach now once in a while, which is called um, Sex in the Single Building, to uh, the kind of courses I took as a student at Berkeley in the 1980s. Uh, one difference between the Faculty of Arts and the Faculty of Engineering is that I actually put sex in the title of my course to attract students to it who think it's going to be about sex. That's very different than, than uh, the way things happen on this side of the campus. But seriously, I should, um, I should, uh, I wanted to remember that I was lucky enough at Berkeley to have a pioneering women's historian, Mary Ryan, on my dissertation committee. And she, in her um, History of American Women course, uh, referred to it as an add women and stir approach uh, to history. And I think that's just so different than what we do now, which is to push Mary's um, cooking analogy, we might have it as a more blended history or a completely pureed kind of approach um, to the field. So that in my own um, discipline of architectural history, uh, as I said, the, the generation before me looked at women architects. My generation completely resisted that and in fact um, saw uh, the spaces mostly homes that we studied, not as spaces of containment or limitation, but actually as evidence of resistance that women had lived in wonderful ways in, in modern cities and houses. And that, that's a huge difference, that move from a negative kind of w add women and stir to a very positive um, modernism wasn't so bad uh, understanding of modern architecture. You talked about uh, blending. Um, Elizabeth uh, talked about the possible problems of the uh, focus on masculinity uh, as uh, potentially bringing back um, a, a renewed focus on men. What are the um, costs and benefits of this sh shift away from uh, women and stuff? You go well, ahead, uh, Just uh, two points. One, in terms of, I just want to comment, if I may, on on uh, Ad and Stir, <laughs> that uh, we d in in defending <coughs> that going back to the '70s when we were trying to defend these courses, which we had to do, mm -hmm. we had to do it uh, at. Uh, well, at, at Toronto, they sort of thought it wouldn't make a difference, so we didn't have to defend it. They said, let's just let, oh, let Jill and Natalie do it. But at Berkeley, we had to defend it. And at Princeton, I remember we had an entire day of faculty meeting where we had to marshal all our forces 
to get to get these courses approved. Uh, so it, it we but but uh, in those years, the argument we, we really made and we met it that it wasn't just an add-on. We claimed, and I think we were right, that the addition of women and gender courses, and we began to use the term fairly soon, would make a difference in the way you thought about history. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in some of the kinds of things I said before about periodization and what you meant by a period, uh, in the way you thought about state building, uh, in the way you thought about the thing that you said about the difference between yourself moving from women as makers to consumers, mm -hmm. the work that was done in, um, in and it, it came about through people interested first in women as industrial workers and then as women as, cons women as consumers, that the putting of consumption Mm -hmm. on the map uh, in, in doing, just let's stay with Europe, the early modern European history and colonial history really was often pioneered by people who looked, who looked at women. Mm -hmm. So that the argument that it, that it was not just going to be an add-on, that it, that it would change, not, you know, not revolutionize everything, because you don't want to ex make extravagant claims, but that it would make a difference. I, I think that, uh, uh, as I said, we tried to make it early, and I think it, it, has, it has been uh, uh, borne out. Um, you know, um, I, don't, I don't think, uh, um, I see what you're saying about the masculinity. I think that if this is taught right, I mean any topic can, can, be, can be excluding or can, be, uh, can impose a certain approach. Any topic can be treated that way. But uh, I think that, that uh, bringing in uh, more consciously a, the study of, of masculinity is an enrichment for the, the, the study of gender. That it, it, uh, it, it, it uh, I mean, uh, working on slavery, slavery right now, the, uh, the implications of, uh, this has been talked about a great deal in the popular text, but the, inf the implications for the, the slave uh, community, for being enslaved, for men and women, are, are, are complex, and they partly depend not just on gender, but on status and origin and so forth. And uh, it's an enrichment, I think, to, to do them both. So I, 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 know, I know why people say this, and uh, I'll just give you an example of, of, uh, uh, of this feeling. I understand the feeling. When, in, when I, I mentioned this Paris reaction, in Paris when I had suggested uh, different ways of constructing courses uh, that I thought would, would lead to new, new ways of generating perspectives and theories and interpretations and new ways of doing comparison and not always just talking about the history of women. Not that people only do, but what I, what I was uh, uh, greeted with a really strong denunciation <coughs> by an old time French feminist, probably about my generation, who said, if we do that, uh, we will just, if, if we give up on talking about the history of women, we will lose the battle. So I understand that perspective. I understand it, but I think the, uh, and I think one should respect it. I, again, I think this is what I would call a creative debate. Uh, if I may just add this one thing, that, that in, in our field to begin with, we were, I mean, in our, in my generation, we were having this this kind of argument about those of us who wanted to be doing family and do class as much as gender with those who are more committed to looking at the history of women, uh, uh, female solidarity. And I, I still th think, just as I think that the, just the, the debate about what, what the variables are that, that define gender, I think that this can be a creative debate. In a way, what we are talking about now that tension, I think, should persist in the field, should maybe be central in courses, and let it keep going. There is no simple, there's no simple resolution here, and there perhaps shouldn't be, but the, the two different ways of, of, of talking about the field could persist uh, in, in, in sparks with, with each other. I actually totally agree. I, mean, I, I wouldn't for a minute try and defend um, you know, returning to the battle days of ad women and stuff. And, and I, I think that what we're trying to do in gender studies is get to a realistic understanding of the world in some ways, and that is not possible without encompassing uh, 
a, a wide range of things, including masculinity, I think that is absolutely central to the field. It's transformed the way that I think and do my own work. So I'm not for a minute uh, wanting to step back from that. I have. I have observed in practical university politics that there are a couple of pieces of roadkill when you make that shift, but I, and that might include um, community alliances in some respects, it might include some generational tensions, but I actually don't think for a minute that that has anything to do with the intellectual argument for the, uh, I think the, the value of transforming the field. I wouldn't want any of the roadkill though to be um, a, a sense that you could shift the field to the point that you would no longer um, include, at some level, discussion of you know, women's experience and gender oppression as you know, important and, you know, I would say, central. But, but that is only a hope that the roadkill could be limited um, rather than uh, uh, any kind of sense that this isn't a fundamental, central transformation, necessary transformation in, in the field. Should I say something? I'll just add my own anecdote that I'm, I'm now trying to move into both um, queer space and uh, mass studies of masculinity and architecture, and that I feel like I absolutely am using the methods I developed um, in my work on women in space to study men in space. So for example, I have a new paper on men's clubs in Montreal. I've always had this theory, I call it big house theory, that any building designed for women or girls looks like an overblown house. <laughs> Daycares, schools, anything, parts of hospitals. And um, so I'm trying to test that big house theory by looking at three men's clubs in Montreal. They definitely are big house. They are big blown up houses. And, um, but the power relations within the floor plan actually work in the opposite way. So I don't see them as uh, one way or another. Um, studying masculinity and space is helping me to understand um, what women in space. Let me uh, ask you a related question. Sticking with this uh, sense of your trajectories over the last two or three decades, uh, I'm bringing up the question of risk. Um, as, uh, <coughs> as women and as uh, scholars of women and gender, to what extent do you feel that you have taken the risks in your careers, and how has the level of risk shifted over that time period? And what risks would you encourage students to take today? <coughs> well, <coughs> I didn't, the things that other people thought were risky, I just thought were fun. <laughs> I just thought they were wonderful adventures, and I didn't care what people thought. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I do care uh, under some circumstances, but not not here. And I, I think that uh, uh, some of the experiences that I had uh, when I was when when I was young uh, sort of got me not thinking not having to think about uh, what, what my teachers thought or what my immediate superiors thought. Uh, I get a, I'm just, since you asked, just drawing on my personal experience, since we were sort of political outcasts in the 19, when I was in my 20s, uh, a wonderful period because I was having my children, but we had this all this business with the McCarthy period and so on and so forth, the House Committee. Uh, the whole question of, of uh, of ordinary graduate student success or success in my early years as a student, well, that was that was just way off. <laughs> that 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 was I didn't I, I couldn't I don't recommend that as a, as a teaching experience <laughs> for the young people here. I'm just saying that in my experience, uh, it it uh, uh, the whole question of taking an intellectual risk was un unimportant. This was just uh, the uh, so. All the things that I, I uh, did, as I say, I, I thought they were just really exciting uh, adventures. The one thing that I would not recommend uh, to younger scholars uh, uh, is to take a topic such as, to, to do with a topic, some of the things that I did in Trickster Travels, where, uh, which is, as I mentioned, the book about this Muslim, where I not only did a lot of work 
uh, in areas uh, where I had a great deal of evidence, because I had this man's that Arab manuscripts, I had a great many manuscripts, and I could work from them to build up in a reliable way his, uh, his mental universe. Uh, that was a very, and I didn't have to keep using words like maybe or perhaps or so forth. But I also wanted, and I was very committed to this, but remember I was, I was doing this when I was retired, so it wasn't on a doctoral, it wasn't a doctoral thesis. I was very committed to wanting to, to bring him to life not only as a mentality, not only from his text, but as a, a Muslim Arab who had been kidnapped by pirates and had and converted to Christianity. Uh, and I want, uh, and I had to work very carefully because his text, and I talked about this actually when I was he here at McGill several years ago presenting this book, his text didn't yield, yield directly evidence where, where I could always talk about this. I had to work m very indirectly. Moreover, in terms of gender, and I may have said this in McGill back in 2006, he did not talk for various reasons about having a wife. <coughs> And I said to myself, I am a historian partly of gender. I am not going to leave this topic without thinking about family issues, gender issues. Sexuality was easier because he talked quite a lot about, about that. That part I could handle. Uh, so, but I wasn't going to do that. So I, did, I used techniques of collateral evidence and various ways of analyzing the text. Collateral evidence was very, very important. Uh, of what the pattern of young men of his age. And I, I wrote that. Uh, I should add that I was glad that Muslim specialists, Moroccan specialists, thought that was very plausible. But it did involve uh, using uh, the, the speculative terms. I had to say maybe, perhaps, we can assume. Uh, that was, I took that risk willingly and absolutely committed to it, and I was very frank <laughs> about it. I wouldn't recommend that, necessarily. I wouldn't recommend centering a, a, a doctoral dissertation or one's very first book uh, in an area where you, where, you, uh, where you may have to constantly make moves uh, of that kind. And it, it's not because I think one shouldn't be adventurous. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, partly, it's partly, I don't know whether you would agree with this, uh, but it's partly when you, when you work and work and work as an historian, you accumulate a, enough evidence uh, enough practice, enough work, so that you know where it's where it's 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 more likely, you're more likely to be on the right track uh, when you move in a speculative direction. You you get when you get this is you know some fields like my husband's mathematics. You could do it when you're really young, <laughs> like 20 years, 18. But in our field, this accumulation of materials and research skills can pay off. I don't mean that young people can't do wonderful work, because I've been hearing about fabulous projects today, but there's a way in which things pay off. Wouldn't you say, I mean, you're still very young, but <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't you say it pays off so that when you move in a speculative venture, you, you have a, a better sense of where you're on good ground. So that would be the kind of risk. But taking a, a, a the, you know, that, that, that you could, you would be a little bit more, you'd be cautious about moving there. But for new and working in new fields, I, I, it didn't seem like risky to me at all. And uh, I didn't care. As I said, I didn't care what people said. <laughs> Actually, do you find yourself ever thinking when you're telling a story, am I taking too many risks? Because uh, I find that in my own work, that I find myself, particularly telling biographies, there's such a temptation to fill in the gaps, mm -hmm. to be the storyteller, to, you know, mm -hmm have this flowing narrative. How do you, in your own work, navigate that, that risk? Well, it, I'm feeling it right now, and I wish I had made the discovery that you made the other day <laughs> with, about your mohawk. As I write about, uh, about the, the, these four generations of the slave family, um, let me tell you what I think the the uh, uh, positive gain is in taking the risk, and then came back to the risk. <coughs> uh, I have just finished a section of this book on the slaves in which I have been, uh, I asked what it meant uh, to have grown up and had the <coughs> and been scarified in Africa, and then you bring your children into the world. Uh, and they are not going to be scar they are not scarified. 
uh, or uh, for the non-Jewish estates in Suriname, what happens if you are used to circumcising the, the, the boys, and actually the girls very often, as was the case in many of these communities, and that doesn't happen with your son and daughter, and so on. And then a whole bunch of things that I knew were part of the world in which these particular slave, enslaved persons grew up, uh, and that they were, uh, some of them are reproduced and some are not. And I wanted to ask about, in the life of an individual man and woman, how they would react to that and what they would do. And, and, uh, and many other very intimate things, because I'm trying to tell it. And what is the value of doing that? Um, it, 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 at least, even if I can't resolve it for them, and I'll come back to what it means to try to resolve it, at least it raises the question. It's a way of talking about uh, the issue, uh, an issue which, if you were doing a, a, a study of more of group, large groups, you might not think to raise. I felt that this was the the advantage in the text on Always On, where I talked not only about a marriage that I mentioned as, as a young man, but I even much more speculative of a possible marriage in Italy. What that allowed me to do was to talk about to narrate, as a, to talk about comparisons between Muslim marriage and European marriage in a very precise way. So it, it, it opens the subject, which you then speculate about. It allows for thought experiments. And similarly, as I write about the slaves, and I think, why am I doing, why am I giving myself such trouble to try to do this when it's very hard to get evidence not talked about? And yet it must have been a question. It is not possible that you would grow up believing that scarification was an, a mark of, of identity of a person, and, uh, uh, sometimes especially of free persons of high status, and suddenly you're not doing this. This must have been an important issue. <coughs> uh, so it seems to me, that seems to be the value of, of, of raising it. Um, if you leave open possibilities for your figures, uh, See, so you asked about how you have a voice that does not impose, that does not impose the historians. I think it, I think that you try to find a narrative style that leaves open some ch some choices for them, for choices for ways of feeling, and and doesn't um, uh, you know do, writes uh, with both vigor <coughs> and vivacity, but in, in a way that uh, that that allows for for some irony uh, in regard to the self. You've got to define that tone. I'm thinking as I'm saying this, is this a, a gender thing that are women more likely to write this way? Men not going to write this way, but I'm sure the men in the audience would say, no, we have as many styles as you do. <laughs> <laughs> would you say that you have as so many? Yes, do you want to weigh on uh, yeah. this? OK. Um, I could ask, oops, put that on. Um, I, I could ask many, many more questions.